Hi, I'm Clark Dennis Cundiff and coming to you today on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all those mothers out there. And uh, of course, I think we all are, uh, at least I've had several mothers other than my biological mother. I've been so blessed to have uh, so many wonderful uh, women in my life that have been uh, a mother to me and in addition to my biological mother who's with God in heaven. So happy Mother's Day. And to all those people who may not be mothers, but serve in that role. Um, we thank you for your servant heart to, to love unconditionally, just as Jesus loved us. And just as a mother will do anything to protect their child out of great love, Jesus would do anything to protect us, right? What is it, the, uh, the scripture that Jesus says that lets us know that indeed we are uh, loved to an amazing degree. You know, the John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will, have, will not perish but have eternal life. That's the kind of love that a mother has for a child. That's the kind of love that Jesus has for us. And today we're talking about the cross. The cross. Upright. It's just a, two pieces of wood, right? It's a cross, but it's so much more for Christians, those who believe in Jesus. And I always love the upward thing is our connection with God and the cross piece is our connection with each other. But even more importantly, it talks to the great love that Jesus has for each and every one of us. So may God open our hearts, minds, and souls as we take a look at God's divinely inspired word and uh, pulling mostly from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25, if you want to reference that in your Bible. And the, the thing is, it's a cross, right? It's just two pieces of wood, but it's also an implement of torture. So why was Jesus crucified on the cross? Why would an instrument of torture be the way Jesus needed to die? Was the cross foolishness or wisdom? Greeks and other people were always looking for wisdom and the Gentiles were always looking for, I mean, the Jews were always looking for signs. And that some people might think, how foolish for the Messiah, the anointed, the son of God, fully human, fully divine, to be tortured and die on a cross. It is that ultimate symbol of death, defeat, total embarrassment. For Jews, the cross is a stumbling block because they expected a Messiah that was going to be a military commander that would defeat all their enemies, right? The Gentiles is absolute foolishness, but for us, the crucified Christ is nothing less than the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, back then, the Romans often used crucifixion on a cross to punish, to torture people because the spikes through the wrist, taking care not to hit the main blood vessel, right, on each side. And then the feet crossed with the spike through the center, holding it there, crunched up to some degree, right? So as you're hanging there, the only way you can breathe is by pushing up on the spike through your two feet at excruciating pain. Can't even imagine the pain. All it takes is walk the Passion of the Christ once and that's the only time I've been able to sit through at least that portion. Some people say they just kind of not look at that portion when they watch it again. But you have to push up onto that two feet to get high enough to get a breath of air and then relax. So ultimately, you may live many, many hours, sometimes up to 24 hours on a cross. So it truly is torture. And indeed, what finally happens is you die from suffocation. Unless maybe you're blessed, they did catch a blood vessel and you die from bleeding out. So why? Why would the Son of God die on a cross? And some of it doesn't make any sense. Like, how does that make any sense at all? And what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 1.18? For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the best sign of the cross is found in the life and conduct of those who are being saved through it by the power of God. Being saved through it, how are we being saved through that? Well, 
1 Corinthians 1.20, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? How has, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Certainly in the world's eyes, it didn't make any sense for Jesus to die on the cross. For Jews demand signs, verse 22, 24, and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Atonement, interesting word. Atonement means the reconciliation of God and humankind through the death of Jesus Christ. Atonement. Of course, I like to look at it as at one meant. A T O N E. Meant. And it's to be at one with someone, to be in a harmonious personal relationship with him. Atonement originally meant at one meant or reconciliation. So this theory of atonement teaches that Jesus suffered and died in place of humanity. That Jesus bore the punishment all of us deserve for our sins, and in doing so, offered grace and pardon for humankind. Often this is referred to as a substitutionary theory of atonement. For here, Jesus took the place. He took the place of, remember Barabbas, who had killed people, who did start an insurrection? Jesus took the place of Barabbas, who his himself was awaiting death. Barabbas, a convicted criminal, was set free, and Jesus, an innocent man, was crucified in his place. So an ordinary person could not die for all humankind, but Jesus, fully human, fully divine, God in the flesh, could die for the sins of the entire world, past, present, and future, so that we can now have a relationship with this perfect God. Otherwise, was limited. So we are meant to look at the cross and see both God's great love and the costliness of grace and to find our hearts changed, transformed, the grace of God by what God has done for us. We are meant as a result of the understanding of that cost to serve God with humble gratitude and to long as we see Jesus suffer never to sin again. Yet of course we do. We're, in a broken world, broken people, we do, we sin again, and we call upon the grace of God revealed on the cross. And because of Jesus' suffering on the cross, we are forgiven each time we ask for forgiveness. Just as the Lord's Prayer says, we're called to forgive others. So he's focusing on what the world would consider foolishness, dying on a cross, suffering and unimaginable torment. but he did it out of love for us. That that was, Jesus three times told the disciples in the New Testament that he, the Son of God, the Messiah, must suffer and die and then be raised from the dead. So without the crucifixion, there is no Christianity. That now we know we can be forgiven our sins because he's paid the price for us. And we know that he died, but yet he raised from the dead. We know that we're in this brief physical part in a longer spiritual journey. So sin is defeated. Death is defeated. So think about it. Jesus faced the whip. Remember, he was whipped near to death before he was crucified. So weak, he couldn't even carry the crossbeam to Golgotha. He faced the whip. He faced the crown, the humiliation, and they put the crown of thorns on him, remember? He did it with determination. He did it with silence. He did it with dignity. I think he's saying, do you see the extent of the Father's love yet? Do you understand that I've come so that you might finally hear of a love that is willing to suffer, yet even to die, in order to win you over, win us over? In Romans 5 8, Paul says, God proves his love, and that while we were still were sinners, Christ died for us. And of course, to John 3 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. That cross is the vehicle for determining the full extent of God's love for each and every one of us. We are loved unconditionally by God exactly where we are. 
and that sacrificial love that Jesus does and suffering on the cross, suffering being flogged, dying and being raised from the dead, that is that transforming grace of Jesus Christ that can transform enemies into friends, shames the guilty into repentance, melts the hearts of stone. We can look at that cross and that gift. I have to strive to live in such a way to be worthy of that sacrifice that I can receive that love and that sacrificial love toward others. That cross piece, right? To love others. Listen to the, girl, the world, right? Follow God's wisdom, not the wisdom of news. Follow the cross, not the latest fad in the world. Follow what is internal, not eternal, not what is fading. Build your house on rock, not sand. Foolishness to the world. But wisdom, saving grace to those of us who believe. 1 Corinthians 1.25, for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. God's weakness is stronger than human strength. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? If you want to be first, you need to be last. Take up your cross and follow me. Humility. Serving others. Think more of other people than you do yourself. It is an amazing fact that if it is in people who realize their own weakness and their own lack of wisdom who in the end are strong and wise. It is a fact of experience that the person who thinks that they can take on life all by themselves is certain to end up in shipwreck. Not me, God. The power of the Holy Spirit that resides in us as Jesus left. We'll celebrate Ascension next week. It left and then Pentecost the week after, left to be with God. But he told the disciples, tells us, I will send you the advocate, the Holy Spirit, to teach you all that you need to know, to be with you always and ever, everyone, as that power of the Holy Spirit resided in him, as we choose to acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and pledge our allegiance to him. So we know better, but sometimes Christians fool ourselves into believing that we can rely upon our own abilities, our own expertise, our own planning and sophistication. But in the shadow of the cross, such wisdom and thinly veiled attempts at control seem foolish. I'm a recovering control person. I acknowledge it, Lord. I fight that surrender. I got plan A, B, C, D, E, when all I really need is plan G, God's plan. We plan, God laughs. Not that you know that I'm not, the planning's good, preparation's always good. We're supposed to do all we can, right? That's not the part. For Christians, the cross declares that we embrace truth when lies seem easier. We embrace gentleness when force may be attractive. Justice for the oppressed while maintaining the status quo would be simpler. Generosity when hoarding would be more comfortable. Lord, forgive me, I'm a hoarder. <laughs> Repenting every day. Getting better. Giving more and more stuff away every day. Forgiveness. When a hateful grudge would taste so good. So what do we value? The foolishness of the cross? Yes. Against the world's wisdom? Yes because we are being saved from perishing, saved from our own self-serving actions, saved from our sinful selves. So we're not looking with a human point of view, are we? We're looking through a, a God point of view. God bestows infinite value upon us that does not depreciate as we age, does not rise or fall with our grade point average or annual income. The new hypothesis is that God values each person as God's own creation, save for the mission of the church. The cross, foolishness or wisdom. I choose to believe in the saving grace of Jesus Christ, fully human, fully divine, suffered on the cross that I may be forgiven of my sins, died and was raised from the dead that I know that death has been defeated. So the cross always represents that saving grace and love 
of God for each and every one of us. May God bless you, and happy Mother's Day. Bye-bye.